and they happened to have lots and lots and lots and lots of gold. And Cortes from Spain wanted that gold. And so 11 ships and 500 soldiers go across the ocean, they land on the shore, they get off the boats, and Cortes goes to the men, burn the ships. And the men were like, pardon? And so Cortes' mindset was this. If we're going to defeat the Aztecs and capture this gold, we have to be all in. And the way I'm going to get these men all in is to burn the ships. And so he told them again, burn the ships. We're not going home in our ships. We're going home in their ships. And to get their ships, we have to conquer them. And so they literally burnt their 11 ships, their one-way ticket home. They're only, you know, they're... Not their only, because they could get the Aztec ships, but their most reasonable course of action was to go home in their ships, and they burnt the ships. And history kind of says is that just kind of lifted the momentum and the, and the motivation in the men of kind of like, we've got to win. Because if we don't win, <laughs> we ain't getting home, and I want to get home. And so now, burn the ships is kind of this analogy of like being all in, moving forward. There's no way back. The only way is forward. And we want to talk about that a little bit this morning, of this aspect of if, if we're not careful, our future can easily just become an extension of our past. What I mean by that is if we're not careful, we just keep living out the same, what we keep doing, what we keep doing, what keep doing. And all of a sudden, we're, nothing has changed. Our past has become our future, and it's just maybe we've added some years to our life. But there's these moments in life where God is kind of calling us and saying, hey, I'm calling you to be this. And there becomes a choice. Do we hold on to our past or we do we move into that new future? Because it's impossible to move into that new future while you're still holding on to the past. Because you can't be ripped in two. So I said last Sunday we're we're spending our time in the it's actually two books called First and Second Kings this month. And it's just um, when I was a teenager, this was the books that I liked to read. Uh, that made me sound like I read the Bible way more than I actually did when I was a teenager. But uh, uh, like I, you know, when I did pick it up, I wanted to read like about like battles and wars and swords and that kind of thing. And and th these two books kind of have that. And there's this fascinating in First Kings chapter 19. There's some fascinating stories. Actually, First Kings 18 and 19. It, it it's, it's revolves around this one person named Elijah. He was a prophet, and so. A prophet's job was to speak on behalf of God to the people. And so he'd go around, and, and it, the story kind of in 18, it goes where he's having a bit of a tiff with the queen and because they're worshiping a false god named Baal. And he does this amazing, miraculous thing where they, they have this altar, and he, and he asks God to shoot down fire from heaven, and it consumes the altar. And, uh, and this is like a moment for the nation where they turn away from Baal and towards God. But the problem with that is the queen didn't quite like that. And so she wanted to kill Elijah. And so Elijah's running. And all this stuff is happening for Elijah. And it's all this like, it's amazing. It's action packed. And then in this moment, God says to Elijah, okay, you're going to pick the next prophet to, to take over from you. So there's this guy named, when you read it, it's a little easier. When you hear it audibly, it's hard. Elijah and Elisha. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overpronounce them so you kind of, we get them. But um, he says, there's this guy, Elisha, that I want you to go and you're going to anoint him. You're going to pick him as the next prophet. So we have... I gotta get those working. There we go. 
So we have Elijah. And he's doing what he's done probably every day up to that point. He was working his job. And his job was, at that point, to till the ground. Agriculture. He's growing stuff. But you've got to remember, this is, this is a deserty, dry land. So I, I envision him, he's got a bunch of oxen, and he's a till, and he's working the ground. It's hard, and it's dry, and it's dusty, and it's just a day like any other day. And this is what the passage says. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Saphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12 pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my, my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So when we read Scripture, we open the Bible and we read something, one, probably the, the simplest way to read it is we just read it and say, oh, that was nice, and we put it down, and we leave it. And that's not horrific, but uh, it's always helpful if we just, when we read it, we just ask some questions. And one good question is just to be, we, we talked about when I prayed, I said, hey, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. So when, when we say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit resides with us. It's like we're linking arms. And so one thing to do when reading is like, okay, God, the Holy Spirit, can you just, is there anything you want to say to me in this? And when you read it, if something just kind of pops out at you or you find interesting or resonates you, you just kind of think about it for a second. Okay, are you trying to tell me something here? And so my question for you is, one of my problems with this interaction, me up here talking, you up there sitting, it's so um, passive for you guys and so active for me. If, 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 to be honest, well, how I'd rather do this is, uh, you know, I could take each of you out to a coffee shop and we just chatted about it. And I said, hey, this is, you know, let's talk about this and here's the Bible, let's talk, let's dialogue in it together. Um, <laughs> are you offering to pay? <laughs> the time, I guess, is part of it. It's hard to, you know, get us all together uh, time-wise. But, um, what, what I want to do is we're going to read it again, or I'll read it again, but I want you to think this question. Does anything kind of pop out to you or resonate to you? This is a question. There's no right or wrong. And I'm, I'm not going to point you out and be like, you have to answer me. Um, but, uh, so I'm not going to embarrass anybody or not going to point anybody out. But I just want you to in yourself. Does, as I read it again, is there anything that kind of just, oh, that's interesting, or oh, that's powerful. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Saphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12 pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. So this is a narrative story, so sometimes, you know, there's other parts, there's all different genres in the Bible. There's poetry, there's there's letters, there's kind of more laws and teaching. This is a narrative story. So now the, this, this is optional. Did anything kind of just resonate, with, pop, pop out at you? Do you want to share that? This is, this is trying to be a little less passive. Daryl, 
No, I'm sure I said I wouldn't point anybody out. Uh, but uh, anybody? Um, so the killing the oxen, burning it, it's like lying in the sand. I'm done this and I'm moving on to this. We're done. That's <laughs> lying. <laughs> It's a burn the ships kind of moment, isn't it? Let's put, put this in context. Um, it would be like if you're a tradesperson and you just put all of your equipment on Kijiji and be like, I'm done doing this. I'm selling everything. It, it would be like the artists gathering all of their whatever slice of artistic expression they have. They're a painter and they're gathering all their canvases and paints and paintbrushes and throw it in the fireplace and throw a match on it. I'm not doing that anymore. Absolutely. So again, they, they don't have RSPs, they don't have banks, they don't have all this kind of stuff. So wealth was in land and animals, like that, that's where you, that's w that was your wealth. And so 24 oxen, I think even today, 24 oxen would be like, oh wow, that's like, that's quite a bit. I grew up in Manitoba. Uh, I'm a sit, my wife reminds me all the time, I'm a city slicker. Evie grew up small town Manitoba. And so when I'd visit her, um, her friends and families were farmers. Her parents were teachers, but you know, there's all these so I'd be talking to these farmers and trying to fake it because, you know, when you're a young adult trying to court a girl, uh, you try to impress people. And I'd fail miserably because uh, I don't know farming. But I remember talking, it was just, we were talking cattle. And I was just like trying to shoot the breezes on the guy. I'm like, well, how much is like a cow worth? You know, I'm thinking, I don't know, like 50 bucks or somewhere. And he's like, oh, well, yeah, you know, I sell that one. For, I, I can't remember at that time. It was like $1,200 or $1,500. And I was like, wow, can I have one? <laughs> you know? It's a lot of money. So this oxen, like this is a lot of wealth. So it's not like, you know, he's burning five dollars. This is his livelihood and all his wealth. He's burning and feeding people. And, and, and the interesting thing, oh, were you going to say something? Yeah. He's stepping under somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We always love that, being under people. Um, and, and let's make this clear. When, when, when Elijah is putting the cloak on, that, that's in a form of anointing, of saying, you are going to take my cloak. You're... You're going to take over from me. This, the symbolism would have been crystal clear to Elisha. Um, and so he knew exactly what, what was being asked of him. But, but it wasn't a turning from like, I was doing something wrong and now I'm going to do something right. Or I was doing something evil and now I'm going to do something you know, good. It, it, it wasn't something like that. It was, God is calling me to do this and I have to let go of this to be able to step into what God is calling me to do. And I find often when God calls us to do something, to step out, we either don't let go or we drift back. So, so here's another important thing of reading the Bible is if you start to see patterns, so the same thing happening, it usually means like important, important for our lives. It'd be like this, Evie saying, hey Tyson, can you take out the garbage? And then a half an hour later, Tyson, the garbage. And then 10 minutes later, the garbage, Tyson. She doesn't even have to raise her voice. It's just the frequency is expressing the uh, importance. By that last one, it's like she, all she has to say is, 
look at me and say garbage. And it's like, if it doesn't happen, right? You know, this is important to me. That it never gets that far in our house. Um, <laughs> I'm a perfect husband, um, and she's not here. So, so when, when, when you see things kind of, you know, over and over and trends happening, uh, it, it's like, hey, this is value, this is important. So, classic example would be the nation of Israel. Have you seen like the old cartoon Prince of Egypt, you know, and the story of Moses and, and the, the, the people of Israel being delivered under slavery of Egypt and they cross the Red Sea and they're set into, you know, they're set free. The interesting thing about that story is they miraculously get, you know, they get delivered from Egypt. This sea gets parted. They cross it. The Egyptian army goes to chase after them. The sea kind of collapses back on them. The Egyptian army drowns. And shortly after that, seeing this miraculous stuff, life gets, starts to get a little hard for them. And you know what they say? Man, I'd sure like to be a slave again. We had it pretty good when we were in Egypt. This idea of God was calling them to be free and to go to the promised land and to be all that God had called Israel to be, and they're still holding on to being a slave. Now, we often don't see, you know, the option of like, oh, I want to hold on and still be a slave. But we see ourselves, instead of giving up our freedom, maybe we call it safety or comfort or security. We're here, and God's calling us over here. And, and we, we got to hold on to this because it's comfortable or it's safe. So another example of this is, is Jesus. It, it really becomes kind of the central narrative of following Jesus. And so there's this story where people are asking, Jesus is asking people to follow him, or they're asking Jesus, can, can we follow him? And this is, this is how Jesus responds. As they're walking along the road, a man said to him, to, said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, like that sounds pretty definitive, like I will follow you wherever you go. That sounds like all in. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another man said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. It almost has like a, he's referencing Elisha there, a nuance to Elisha. But Jesus is saying, you, you can't follow me into the future if you're still holding on to your past. You, you, you can't move forward with Jesus if you're still Still holding on, like, yeah, yeah, I want to go with you there, Jesus, but I s want to stay here. He's saying that, that's not how it works. So, so a simple question is like, well, what's Jesus calling me to? You know, like, it, maybe, maybe I'm not holding on to the past. Maybe, maybe I'm just like, this is, I am where I'm supposed to be. And that could be. So, so there's simple things. That we're all called... To something. When you say yes to Jesus, we're all kind of called to something. So we sang about it in one of our songs. You're a child of God. You're a child. Kind of that you are loved unconditionally. It's like you're a good parent will do anything for their child. God, God, God will do anything for you. And you're loved. 
And then we're called to love, have that love spill out of us. We're to love those around us. So probably one of the, the most simple questions in day-to-day life when, when you're confronted with stuff is to ask yourself, what is the most loving thing to do in this situation? And for me, how I kind of like practically go that through is by definition, I think love is selfless. It's hard to be loving and selfish at the same time. So is this act about, you know, when, when I'm trying to love someone, am I doing it for, for me? It's like the person that, you know, is going to help somebody out. Maybe let's say they're going to get them some groceries. But they want to, you know, they put on Facebook that they're giving that, you know, social, hey, I'm giving that person groceries. And then it's like, hey, here's your groceries. Can we take a selfie together with these groceries? And uh, can you tell your friends that I gave you groceries? And, you know, like that, that's not love. That's like you're trying to look good. And really, probably the most loving thing you can do is to, to, to introduce someone to Jesus. If, if Jesus is, has impacted your life in any way, then wouldn't you, like, the most loving thing is to, to have Jesus impact other people's lives. What they do with that introduction, that's, that's, that's for them. But here's the thing. You are all different in, in the most best way possible, when I say that, you're all different. Evie and I often talk, how is it possible that the same two human beings created three boys that are all so different? I always find that fascinating. If you lined up our three boys and you never met them, they look like brothers, but they all act differently. In the most wonderful and not so wonderful ways. Um... It, but, you know, they, they, they all interact and relationship with people, extrovert, introvert, you know, all those ty- d- dynamics are all different. They're all uniquely gifted. Creativity, engineer brain. We got one that has an, I call it engineer brain. You know, like A equals B equals C. You know, if I want to get him to do something, I just got to logically explain it, and it gets done. Another one, I got to talk to the heart. You know, and if, if the... If it's the heart hits the heart, oh yeah, I'll get that done. The other one, when he was young, I tricked him. I made it a competition. I bet you I can clean this up faster than you. Oh no, you can't. And then I'd go really slow and boom, it's done, you know? Because he's competitive, you know, and I was using that to my advantage like any good parent. But you are the same way. You guys are all wired differently in different gifts. Some of you, man, you, you see a crowded room and you step into it and you're like, this is life-giving. And others of you are like me and you step into your room and you're like, oh boy, I hope I have enough energy for this. Some of you see what I'm doing, talking in front of people, and you're like, that, I would rather have all my teeth pulled out. Others of you are like, I could do a better job than him. <laughs> and you're probably right, Daryl. You probably are right. <laughs> I don't know why I'm picking on you, but I am. Um, you know, like, it's, you know, we're all gifted and wired, and it's not a good or a bad, it's just different. And let's be honest, the, creati- the, the, the variety makes life more interesting. It'd be terrible to be friends with people that are exactly like you. You know, that, that, that doesn't sound like fun. But that uniqueness, that gifting, is part of what you're called to do. So this is what I think. Uh, I think we, we get too stuck on the job that we have. So this is, this is what I feel like God's called me to do. I feel like God has called me to invest in people to help them be all that God's created them to be. That's what I feel like my life is is supposed to be spent to do. So that's in my family unit to do that. My neighbors, my friends. It just so happens my job, when people ask, what do you do? I say, pastor. 
I've said this many times, I get all sorts of unique and interesting responses when I say that. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay, it says nothing to do with the message, but I've got to tell you this about my life. I went and looked at a car to buy on Friday, and just like a cheap car, and I'm t- talking to the guy, he had a bit of a Newfie accent, and uh, he goes, oh, what do you do? I'm a pastor. Oh, my uncle was a Baptist pastor. Oh, that's so cool. Um, is your church Baptist? No, it's, we're part of the, it, we don't talk about this very often, but we're part of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. So I said, oh, I'm a, I, our church is Pentecostal. Oh, do you speak in tongues? <laughs> I just want to look at the car guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then he's like, when you speak in tongues, do you get tired? Do you, and he, had, like, he had this whole litany of questions, and so it just became in this big conversation about, that's my life. I'm just saying. So it was interesting. Um, <laughs> anyways, I just happened to, my job, my, like when people ask, what do I do? It just happens to be pastor. But I'll tell you this. If I was a janitor, all that would change is instead of writing a sermon part of my week, I'd maybe be sweeping floors part of the week. My, what I feel God's calling me to do would still be, how can I help people to become all that God's created them to be? And so now I'd be getting to know coworkers. If I was at a janitor in a school, I'd be maybe talking to the students, the teachers. Nothing changed. Like, my vocation, what I'm built to do, is helping people become all God's called them to be. My job is just one of many tools to accomplish that. It just happens to be location. So what has God called you? What is he calling you? What, is, what does he want your future to be? Elisha was called to be a prophet. I feel I'm called to help people be all that God's called them to be. What are you called into? And it could be even specific. So I left that conversation on Friday thinking, oh man, I should have probably, like, who cares about a car? But I was under a time crunch. I, I, was, I was in between practice for a kid, and I, you know, I had to get there to pick him up and all this stuff. And so my brain's thinking about time, and Evie's at this retreat having all this great alone time, and I'm parenting by myself, trying to buy a car. And after I was driving away, I was like, man, like, that was like t-ball. It was like God played t-ball with me. This guy's asking me all these, like, questions. And I didn't, like, say forget, like, the kid could wait, the car can wait, let's have a conversation. And in some ways, in that moment, I was holding on to comfort. I was holding on to my schedule. And I wasn't stepping into the future that God had for me. Who knows where that conversation could have led. He literally asked me four or five questions about faith. And I answered them as succinctly and quickly as possible with no like follow-up or open-ended questions. So that's my story of failure, I guess, this week. But Elijah drew a line in the sand. He burnt to everything. He said, I'm not going to hold on to my comfort. I'm not going to hold on to my, you know, security, this financial security. I'm going to burn it and step into what God's calling me to do. And I wonder if I could have, on Friday night, been a little bit more like Elisha. Instead of holding on to comfort and a little bit of fear and judgmentalism, I could have stepped out into what God was calling to me in that moment. And so my question for you is this. What do you hold on to? Is it comfort? Is it a past hurt? Anger? Fear of failure or rejection? That, prob- that would be a big one for me. 
fear rejection, even from a stranger. But what do you hold on to that you maybe need to be like a little bit more like Elisha and be like, you know what, I need to burn this down and step forward into the future that God's calling you to. Because you can't move into the future God's calling you to and hold on to the past at the same time. So all you do is drag that past into your future. It needs to be a letting go of it, a burning of it. And so we're, I want to do this to close. I'm going to give you 30 to 60 seconds. Just long enough that it's a little uncomfortable, but short enough that it's not too long. And I want you, are we being too honest here this morning? Um, I want you just to think about that. Is there something that I'm holding on to that's not allowing me to move forward into the future that God has for me? And as you reflect about that, if there is something, I'm not going to assume everybody is, but if there's something like me, like fear of rejection, maybe for you it's something totally different. Can there be a, kind of a spiritual burning of it where you just say, okay, I want to draw a line in the sand, God, and I want to move forward into what you have for me. So, might be helpful to close your eyes. Again, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but just give you that 30 to 60 seconds, and I want you to reflect on that. Is there something you're holding on to? And then I'll close in prayer. So God, this might be even a little cheesy, but I, but I kind of hope this is a little bit like a moment in history for some people like it was for Cortez and those soldiers, kind of the burn the ships moment. Or better yet, probably like Elijah. It's burn the oxen. Uh, drawing a line in the sand and I am going to be done with this and move forward in this. I pray that you would help us to move forward into the future that you're calling us, God. Each person here is just so uniquely created, so uniquely gifted, that you would just show how amazing each person here and how you put them now in this location, at this time of history, with their unique mix of temperament and personality and giftingness for the people that are around them. To connect and love with the people around them. Help them to see the future that you have for them, God. And that they need to let go of the past to move into that. So we praise you and thank you, God. Amen. Just like I say most Sundays, we have coffee, tea, water, but that's just all a little tool to, for conversation. Uh, we're not a rush out of here, church. I encourage you to have one, at least one good, rich conversation with somebody before you leave. And uh, you do not have to rush and get your kids. And uh, it's great having you. Hope to see you next Sunday. And uh, have a fantastic week moving into the future that God has for you.